There are few topics more fascinating than the strange and wondrous world of operating systems. I decided to make an iceberg video to show you just how deep the rabbit hole goes. We start at the top, with interesting yet relatively well-known concepts and facts, but the farther down we go, the more obscure and bizarre these topics become, till eventually we reach the bottom of the iceberg. System sounds are the sound effects that you hear around an operating system or other interface. For example, the sound that your phone makes when you charge it, or the ambient noises of a game console's menu. They provide so much personality and emotion, and have the ability to greatly enhance the user experience. Whether it be the uncanny yet charming Skype noises, the dreamlike Wii U ambient sounds, or even that slightly creepy old Samsung ringtone. System sounds are an integral part of so many UIs. Startup and shutdown noises are another type of system sound. The most iconic ones are probably the Microsoft Windows sounds. The Apple lock noise is another one that most people instantly recognize. But besides these examples, virtually every device and operating system has their own unique startup and shutdown noises. Basically the visual equivalent of startup and shutdown sounds, splash screens are brief images or animations that are shown while a program or device is starting up. Every OS has their own splash screen, like Android, Apple, Windows, Mac OS, and pretty much every gaming system ever. Some are pretty lame, like a static image, but others are really cool, with dynamic animations and sometimes even sound. Pretty much everyone knows the difference between iOS and Android, but unless you yourself own an Android device, you might not be aware that unlike iOS, where every phone looks the same, with Android, each Android manufacturer makes their own flavor of the operating system, called a skin. It's basically an extra layer put on top of stock Android that can add different features, a different look and feel, and lots and lots of bloatware. Uh, I mean extra apps. For example, Samsung's version, or skin, of Android is called One UI, which differs from OnePlus's Oxygen OS, which differs from Motorola's MyUX. Even the Google Pixel's version of Android isn't exactly stock. The real stock Android is open source and doesn't contain the Google framework. Google adds these services and apps on top of Android for their Pixel line. It's hard to have been on the internet without bumping into some sort of reference or picture of Clippy, the iconic Microsoft Office Assistant that offered users tips and help. Clippy, a paperclip whose real name is actually Clip It, was introduced in Microsoft Word 1997 and featured by default up until 2004, at which point you had to manually enable him. Clippy is by far the most famous Microsoft Digital Assistant, but there are others. These include the Dot, the Genius, the Office logo, Mother Nature, Scribble, F1, Bosgrove, Genie, Max, Merlin, Peavy, Robbie, Rover, and Kyra the Dolphin. If you don't already know, up until 2019, Android named each of their software updates after a sweet treat. But did you know that this dessert naming scheme actually follows an alphabetical order? Android Alpha and Beta were A and B, then came the dessert names with Cupcake, Donut, Eclair, Froyo, Gingerbread, Honeycomb, Ice Cream Sandwich, Jelly Bean, Kit Kat, Lollipop, Marshmallow, Nougat, Oreo, and Pie. The remaining Android versions are Android 10, 11, and 12. Kinda boring. But internally, the team still gives their projects dessert names. Android 10 being Queen Cake, 11 being Red Velvet, and 12, Snow Cone. Android's mascot is a cute green robot named Bugdroid, whose look was actually inspired by the little people icons on bathroom signs. Linux's mascot is a penguin named Tux, and he was chosen because Linus Torvalds, the creator of Linux, loved penguins. BSD's mascot is a demon, named after Software Demons, which is a kind of computer program that runs as a background process. As for Apple and Microsoft, well, they do have logos, but since they're inanimate objects, they don't really count as mascots. 
Skeomorphism is a GUI design style featuring UI elements that mimic physical objects. Skeomorphism was most popular during the 2000s and early 2010s. Older versions of iOS are probably the best examples of well-implemented true skeomorphism, along with other Apple software from that time period. Skeomorphism was not just a popular style, but a tool that helped transition the general public to foreign concepts like smartphones, tablets, and the cloud. Since skeuomorphic interfaces are more natural and familiar for new users, it was the perfect way to ease people into a new way of life. Neomorphism is a UI design style that was born from skeuomorphism, hence the name Neomorphism. It looks sort of like a mix between skeuomorphism and flat design. It has the dimension of skeuomorphism, yet takes on the abstract iconography and texturelessness of flat design. Neomorphism has been trending for a year or two now, and a lot of apps have adopted the look. While I think some projects implement it really well, other times I think it can feel a bit cliché. The Nook is an e-reader tablet owned by US book retailer Barnes & Noble. Back in the early 2010s, Barnes & Noble was trying to get the Nook to be a serious contender in the tablet space. Their early products were full-fledged tablets with bright color screens, an app store, and of course, e-reading capabilities. Nook OS was a heavily modified version of whatever was the current iteration of Android. And I am actually shocked at how modern this OS looks, considering it's from 2011. While iOS and Android at the time looked like this, I think that Nook software would fit right in today. While nowadays it's hard to find any mention of the Nook, back in the day, they were on the front page of the Barnes & Noble website and displayed all around the store. I remember being bombarded by Nooks while shopping and playing Angry Birds on the demos. But despite Barnes & Noble's attempt to get into the tablet space, the Nook faded away over the following years until it became what it is today, a largely forgotten yet still available e-reader. In 2014, many technology companies went through a rebranding toward flat minimalism. Microsoft led the change with the release of Windows 8, a wildly minimalistic OS and a shock coming from Windows 7. Later that year, Apple released their newly designed software, iOS 7. Again, a massive change from the old design. Shortly after, Android bid farewell to their hollow design language and introduced a new era of Android with Android Lollipop. All in all, 2014 was a pivotal year for technology, design, and the future of the digital world. The cause for this 2014 phenomenon is debatable, but I have a hunch that competition, trends, and the desire for change were contributing factors. And while no one knows the real reason for this design trend, at least as far as I'm aware, it's interesting to note that it coincides directly with the advent of Web3. Basically, the history of the internet can be broken up into three parts so far. Web 1, the early stages of the internet, Web 2, the start of forums and interactive websites, and Web 3, with AI, crypto, and the internet of things. Web 1 had its own look, but with the start of Web 2 at the turn of the century, glossy and maximalist designs started to become popular. I've even seen some people refer to this type of design as Web 2 gloss. Then, with the arrival of Web 3 in the early 2010s, the design landscape changed again, becoming increasingly more minimalist and flat. Though it's only a theory, I think that the introduction of Web 3 could be a probable trigger for this 2014 redesign. Windows XP actually had many different themes. Its default theme came in three colors, default blue, silver, and olive green. Other themes include Windows Classic, Royale, Royale Noir, Zune, and Embedded Theme. And there's more. Microsoft Plus for Windows XP was a software expansion pack which offered four new themes, Aquarium, Da Vinci, Nature, and Space, each with their own special system sounds. The Windows XP Media Player is also a gold mine of customization. For one, it has a library full of wonderful skins, including Corporate, Revert, Heart, Headspace, Canvas, Goo, Atomic, 9 Series Default, Blue Sky, Classic, Compact, Iconic, Mini Player, Optic, Pyrite, Quicksilver, Radio, Roundlet, Rusty, Splat, Toothy, Windows Classic, Science, Cyber Channel, Cerulean, Circle, Claw, Blue Grid, Anemone, and Windows XP. And just like with Windows themes, the Aquarium, Nature, Da Vinci, and Space skins were available with the purchase of Microsoft Plus. But besides these surreal and deeply disturbing skins, the Windows XP Media Player has a virtualization feature, which displays colors, shapes, and patterns that move to the music. Other versions of the Windows Media Player include virtualization capabilities as well, but Windows XP had by far the most design choices, with alchemy, ambience, bars and waves, battery, particle, plantoptic, spikes, and musical colors. 
During the 2000s, the Microsoft Office Suite applications for Mac had some of the coolest icons. In 2001, with Microsoft Office version X, we got blobby looking icons with Word, Excel, PowerPoint, email, and Microsoft Messenger. Not gonna lie, these look delicious. In 2004, the icons got a little less glossy. Again, with Word, Excel, PowerPoint, email, and Microsoft Messenger. In 2008, we got another update, this one looking a bit more Windows 70, with Word, Excel, PowerPoint, email, and Microsoft Messenger. The 2011 icons don't look quite as cool in my opinion, but the box art is amazing. PDAs, or personal digital assistants, were essentially pocket computers, most popular in the early mid-2000s. Palm, Nokia, IBM, and even Apple were among some of the companies who made these devices. Pocket PC hardware is cool enough, but the operating systems on these devices were really fascinating. While older PDA software isn't really much to look at in my opinion, the software on the 2000s era PDAs actually looks quite nice to me. The two most popular of these being Palm OS and Windows Mobile. Palm OS looks sort of rough around the edges and kind of jarring, but Windows Mobile is not only the best looking PDA OS, but a really good looking OS in general. Windows Mobile was ahead of its time, and the fact that it looks like a mini version of their main operating systems is just so amusing to me. After smartphones went mainstream, PDAs pretty much became obsolete. However, a subversion of them still exists. Industrialized or specialized PDAs are still used in corporate and retail settings. Employees use them to scan barcodes, record inventory, perform NFC mobile payments, and manage data. Symbian OS was developed by Symbian LTD in 1998. It was originally created for PDAs, but evolved into a full-fledged mobile operating system. It was utilized by smartphone manufacturers such as Samsung, Motorola, Sony, and Nokia, and was actually the most popular smartphone OS until 2010 when iOS and Android took over. Much like Android, different companies could develop their own user interfaces for Symbian, like Motorola and Sony's UIQ, MOAP for Japanese markets, and Nokia's plethora of different UIs. I think it's a really good looking OS, especially newer versions of it. But due to fierce competition and OS fragmentation, Symbian became a thing of the past. Frutiger Aero is a design style that was popular in the 2000s and early 2010s, which included glossy objects, nature, humanism, and futurism. I'm not going to explain this one in depth since I do have a whole video about it, so go watch that, it's really interesting. Most people are a little nostalgic about early versions of their favorite operating system, but I've noticed that for some reason people seem to be especially fond of TouchWiz, Samsung's old Android UI skin. TouchWiz was around from 2009 to 2017, and was one of the most common Android UIs due to Samsung's widespread popularity. TouchWiz had a very distinct look, with its large colorful icons, blue and green accents, and an emphasis on nature. TouchWiz was well liked, not only because of how widespread it was, but because it was uniquely pleasant and appealing. TouchWiz focused a lot on nature, which automatically makes the phone experience more comfortable, as it resonates with something deep inside us as human beings. This attempt at bringing a sense of humanness to technology is called humanism, and is characteristic of old Samsung. From these devices' packaging, to their slogans, UI, and even system sounds, humanism could be found everywhere, and people liked it. It didn't even seem forced or disingenuous. There was something about old Samsung that really did feel personable and inviting. People like Life Companion and Designed for Humans Inspired by Nature better than Beyond Barriers or Next is Now. Even the name TouchWiz is just so much more personable than its successor, One UI. There's something about old Samsung, especially TouchWiz, that just sticks with people. Everaldo Coelho is a Brazilian graphic designer who specializes in iconography, themes, and user interface design. He's done graphic design work on Mac OS X and Windows XP, and in the 2000s, he created an icon set and theme for KDE, a Linux organization. His first theme, called Crystal, had a distinctive look, with its glossy, crystal-like icons. Everaldo stated that when making the theme, he wanted it to appeal to users of Mac OS and Windows XP, so he designed Crystal UI to be a pleasing blend of the two design languages. Later on, Everaldo created Crystal Clear, which was an update to Crystal and had more of a Windows Vista look. In the late 2000s, Everaldo released the final iteration to his Crystal lineup, the Crystal Project. And just like how his previous icon sets drew inspiration from their corresponding Windows versions, the Crystal Project resembles Windows 7. 
Each of the three crystal icon sets included some of the most iconic Linux imagery, various renditions of Tux the Penguin. If you've been on the internet for some time, you've seen at least one of these icons somewhere. And if you're in the Linux space, then you'll 100% recognize these. Everaldo Coelho is clearly extremely talented, and as someone who dabbles in graphic design myself, I really appreciate just how much talent and time went into making these icons. Everaldo's work across all three platforms played a major role in shaping that iconic 2000s computing look, and has forever changed the world of desktop iconography and UI design. And that brings us to the bottom of the iceberg. I hope this video was as interesting for you to watch as it was for me to make. Thanks for watching.